Uh, welcome. Thank you for coming to this session. What an awesome showing. This is great. Um, I just realized that on the sign outside, it just said this is Microsoft. So you have no idea what I'm talking about, which is cool. Um, I think we had the session name on the agenda, on the schedule. So this is the actual session name. Um, oh, I put that up. See, I had a joke. My joke was going to be, because uh, this is, it just says Microsoft. So I was going to ask, just to make sure you're all in the right room, we're going to learn building Excel macros with VB. Yes. There you go. Thank you. Thankfully, you laughed. I, was gonna, I thought I was showing my age with that joke, but um, it's actually the only joke I have. So it's going to be a long 30 minutes. But um, uh, I only have 30 minutes, so I'm going to try to plow through this uh, quickly and get you up to speed with ETL, with Data Factory, and Databricks. And I'm just skipping the Azure part because you're assuming, at least I always assume everything is in Azure, because I am an Azure program manager on the Azure Data team. So if you were at the keynotes, who was all at the keynotes today? Actually, I, I missed them, so I'm putting my hand down. Um, so my boss's boss's boss, Rohan, was one of the speakers, which shows you where I sit on the uh, on totem pole. But um, anyway, uh, so I focus on bringing to market um, products around uh, data integration uh, in ETL. And when you talk about data integration in ETL within Azure, you talk about Data Factory. So let me ask, who is familiar with Data Factory in the room? Oh my goodness, that's awesome. That's great. Who uses um, Data Factory with uh, Databricks? Even better. That makes sense. It's right at Databricks uh, Spark Conference. All right. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the patterns and some of the things you do with Data Factory. Let me first level set. And actually, while I'm talking, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep up. Uh, I'll make it a different slide, actually. And it looks like that slide's not in this deck. Hang on one second. I think it is here. Give me one sec. I want to switch to a different one. That's fine. I'll, I'll keep it here. So when you think about ETL in Azure, and the reason why I'm here uh, today and this week for the Spark Conference is because um, Data Factory is predicated on the, uh, um, the concept where we're giving you the ability to visually design and build ETL and data integration, data pipelines, and workflows. And uh, those workflows are going to allow you to uh, bring data into Azure, to move data into your databases and your data warehouses and your data lakes and those sorts of things. So Data Factory actually connects into many different sorts of compute engines and different execution engines that you can use to transform your data. And Databricks is, of course, um, one of the primary ones. And we're going to focus on that today since we're here at the Databricks and Spark Conference. But you can also transform your data with um, Hadoop. You can transform it with uh, SQL. You can write your own code. You can do custom code for transforming. Just think about Data Factory as your tool to build workflow. So what I have on the screen is an example of a workflow, a very simple workflow that is a nightly ETL data load. So you're going to build these. You're going to build them graphically. Now, the surface area with Data Factory is more than just uh, graphical. There's also a full SDK with APIs that we provide that you can use to automate uh, pipelines and executing those and building those and managing those and whatnot. But the primary use case is to build these graphically. Now, there's a brand new integration or uh, use that we have in the Data Factory team for um, Databricks that I'm very excited to talk about. Um, it's in preview right now. It's a, a limited public preview, and it's called Data Flows. Data Flows actually utilize Databricks in the back end <clears throat> as the uh, execution engine to transform your data. So the reason why we talk about Databricks a lot and why we're here is because as an ETL tool, I want to move on to another while I talk about this. Think about this while I have this screen up. It's a little bit hard to see the detail, but I have some demos that I think will be a little bit crisper and clearer for you to see. And by the way, just coming back to the 30-minute limit I have, I'm going to probably just plow straight through this, and I'm going to skip a lot of detail. So I'll make myself available in the back. Um, we're out in the hall after uh, this session so that you can ask questions if you want to uh, ask me anything at all about, um, about this. Uh, I'll just kind of give you the overview and get you familiar with what, this, what Data Factory and Databricks is in Azure and how this provides ETL for you. All right, so coming back to this, the natural connection between Spark and Data Factory is that Spark is an is an excellent tool that for uh, data transformation for ETL. What we're bringing to you within Data Factory are two different things. Back to the workflow, this is a pipeline. So you're going to notice also a lot of very similar terminology that's used, because this is really sort of generic data 
pumping, data transforming, data engineering lingo, right? So you're going to hear data pipelines. You're going to hear data sets. You're going to hear data frames, data transformations, all those terms that get used over and over. And so for us to provide, within the Azure team, to be able to provide ETL at scale, we rely on Spark and Databricks to do that. So in this scenario that you see on the screen, you could build a, um, a nightly data load, ETL data load pipeline within Data Factory, and you could bring your own Azure Databricks cluster, a job cluster, for example, and then you could have Python, you could have a notebook, you could have your jar files, and you can execute those with your own custom code uh, on a schedule. So you schedule, you trigger it, you have alerts around the operationalizing of those pipelines. All that is built into Data Factory, and that's what we're providing you. If you do not want to learn um, Pandas or, um, wasn't anyone a Koala? Is that it's Koala? Or if you don't want to learn um, you know, Python or Scala or whatnot, or you want to have things, uh, you want to focus on your business logic, your transformation logic, that's where we have um, the data flow piece. So these are data transformations that are visually designed as a um, constructed left to right graph that you build and you focus on doing things like in this case, this is the slowly changing dimension scenario. So I'm going to look for, at the end of the day, I'm going to be loading a data warehouse that's a star schema. I'm going to have dimensions that are going to have attributes that change, but maybe I want to keep the history on those. Maybe I want to overwrite whatever type you like. You build that here within uh, the visual interface. So what's going to happen is these, these, bl these blocks, like um, some of these are called derived columns, so you're creating new columns, modifying data. The things that you do within Spark code today are automated for you through this process of building a data flow like this. So mapping of fields, type conversions, um, string operations, math operations, all the common things that you always do, um, you simply put a block on the screen and you say, I want to do this, this, and this. I'm going to branch down here and do something else here. I'm going to have a conditional split, do these three different things. If these values are within this range, we handle all the optimization and Scala for you. We take this and we push this down to an Azure Databricks cluster. Now, in this case on Dataflow, ADF, uh, Azure, Data, Azure Data Factory, ADF, we, I realized why that slide wasn't showing up, it was hidden. Uh, now you can see it. There we go. So let me talk. Uh, let me come back to it. Sorry about that. Um, Azure Data Factory, we manage the Databricks cluster in this scenario. So all you have to do is say, I want to run this uh, once a night or once an hour. And we take care of the cluster spin up and tear down for you. If you want to execute these within a pipeline on your own with your own code, uh, then you can, uh, well, then you manage your own cluster. You manage your own Databricks cluster in that case. So you could have an interactive cluster if you're doing things like. Uh, um, you know, data analytics. If you're doing data engineering, then you use the uh, job cluster. I think I got those terms right. This is the slide that was hidden for some reason before that I wanted to show you. So I was going to talk a little bit over this slide. Um, I'll let you soak in this beautiful slide while I talk. Uh, the reason why I wanted to give you this is that I think this gives you the full trajectory of where you would use Data Factory when you build cloud solutions using Azure. Um, not that it does a great job of it, but I was just I was kidding about this soaking in the great slide, by the way. But at the end of the day, if your job as a data engineer, let me come back to this. I just want to make sure I hit this point really hard for you. Data Factory is the data engineer's toolkit and service within Azure. ETL, data integration, data engineering, transformations, all that comes from here within Data Factory. So you see Data Factory provides the scheduling and orchestration across all these different activities. And we can pull data from different clouds, <clears throat> from on-prem, from VMs. It doesn't have to be all within Azure and then we move that data around. Now, the moving of the data is all optimized through our own copy capability. We have our own um, services in the back end that optimize that, and then it's the transformation piece that's interesting probably to a lot of the data science and data engineering folks here this week for the Spark conference. So I'm showing in that middle block that has the Databricks logo in it that you can either bring your own Databricks and you can execute your transmission code, and we can put that within a pipeline, or you use data flows and you just design your logic, and we execute for you. All right, I think I'm done with that. Hopefully it's all making sense so far. Beautiful. Um, I, will, I, I guess I might have time to answer a few questions if we, as we go along, so don't be afraid to, to raise your hand. If I don't see you, it's not, I'm not ignoring you. I just can't see all the, all the lights, but it's all right. All right, another very common scenario that then this brings to light for you is loading star schemas. I mentioned the dimension handling, but you also have to do fax dimension loading. Why that's interesting and different is because this is where aggregations come into play. 
A lot of common things you're going to do when you load your fact table is not just your lookups and your inner joins uh, to get your surrogate keys in your attributes, but now you have to do things like, I want to measure my sales per month. So maybe your fact table is at the month green, so there is an aggregate transform within um, data flow within data factory. So you can use data factory to build that capability without writing any code at all. Um, if you want to write code, you have some custom things that you do, you, then you use a Databricks activity. I'll show you all this in just a minute. Another great scenario is the data science um, sort of data mark kind of creation that you do as a data engineer. ADF is not a data science tool. <clears throat> we have uh, tools for that, and there are plenty of other really good tools for that. Data Factory is a data engineer's tool. So if you're going to be providing data marks and folders of data within your data lake for your data science, which is a common scenario, uh, data factors, which you would use for that. Now, what I'm showing on the screen is the data profiling. You, you can explore your data within data factors. So we give you, um, because we're using Databricks, we can use the APIs that give us um, immediate feedback by sampling data within your lake <clears throat> or your databases, doesn't matter. So we can surface to you things like the, the pie chart is telling you the percentage of nulls within that field. Um, you can uh, do your, uh, your value counts. Uh, you can do your um, standard deviations all the things that you would do to understand your data as a data engineer before you decide that this is what I'm going to carve off and give to my uh, modelers. Okay. Super duper. All right. So those were scenarios. Let's talk a little bit about the pieces of Data Factory now. I'm going to gloss over a lot of this, so I apologize for the speed. I'm on a speed uh, session here for 30 minutes. So let's talk a little bit about the workflow uh, piece of Data Factory. Workflow is creating pipelines. pipelines are what we call essentially control flow constructs. So you're going to see things like branching, if then else, conditional execution. You can create incremental data copies. Uh, oh, I use the word delta. So I'm using every word that comes up in the keynote in, this, in these slides. Not delta, Databricks delta, incremental delta data copy. So a very common thing in ETL and in data integration is you don't want to do a complete copy of everything every time you run this. You only want to do the changes from last time. So we have patterns for that. Connection managers contain the information about all the different things you connect to. So for a great example would be maybe you have an Oracle database and some data in a data lake. You need to join that together, um, create some summaries of that data, and put that into some lake folders and into a SQL Server database. That would all be built within these constructs within Data Factory, and the transformation of the data would occur in Data Flow in Data Factory. So the, the tools that you'll get within your toolkit when you open up Data Factory, by the way, this just step back, sometimes I make assumptions that people know all this stuff already. This is the, the UI for Data Factory. The, um, you get to this from the Azure portal, and um, this is all the, the graphical interface, all in a browser. You can uh, create all of this through PowerShell, through um, APIs, uh, through, our, through our APIs using SDKs, that's all available to you. What I wanted to highlight to you are the three different activities that you will use in Data Factory if you want to orchestrate pipelines for your existing Databricks code. We have them for notebooks, so you can call it notebook code. Uh, we have jar files, so any sort of um, JVM style, jar style language, and Python. So you can execute those from, the, um, from the, the pipeline. You see in the pipeline, what I'm doing is I'm first um, uploading some data, probably getting that from maybe on-prem. I'm putting that into the cloud to do some data flow on it. So my, you can't read it, it's not very clear, but that is called um, uh, clean addresses. There we go. It's called clean address, and after the addresses are cleaned, then I run my model. So I'm, I'm training a model, then after that data has been cleaned, and I'm doing that in Databricks. So the idea here would be that uh, I'm doing the data engineering, I'm doing that 75% of what all you know, analytics projects always take, which is the cleaning and prepping of the data. I'm doing that all within data flow, and then I am calling my, uh, uh, my model training routines within Python. My own Databricks is doing that, my own Azure Databricks is doing that. Uh, the other thing I'm showing here is we connect into, uh, we have CI CD built into the tool, so GitHub uh, is available to you to build these and design these. Um, uh, interactive debug, you can view the results, and then you can um, set your schedules and your triggers to have this run whenever you need to. Now when you're done and you execute these on a daily, hourly, whatever basis, here is your um, dashboard to see what succeeded and failed. Um, and I, I just realized that I have a lot of failures on mine, actually. I don't know where that is, but... Anyway, you have succeeds and failures, and then you can set alerts for these to send you an alert or take an action when something fails or when something succeeds, if you like. 
All right, moving on quickly, quickly. So mapping data flows. Now, mapping data flows is the piece I was talking about called data flows, where you then can take your transformation logic and you can build that graphically and allow us to execute it for you within Databricks. So this example on the screen is showing you how you can take, this actually is a pretty simple example, it has two different sources. The example I gave before, which was Oracle and data in the lake, you can combine that and use a join right here. So you see I have a join as my second step in here. You can join that together because at the end of the day, this uh, UI and this design surface is just looking at data. It doesn't matter where it originated from. So we take this entire logical block that you build and then we convert that into um, a script that gets executed on a Databricks cluster for you. So essentially you need to make this decision when you are um, using Azure and you're in Data Factory to create your data pipelines. You can either do the left or the, or the right. I have not there. This is actually, I should have put I have a different slide here. We actually said or. I know why the slide is hidden, because I, I downloaded my slides, and this was not the same deck. That's OK. The deck you get should be the right deck. If you want to use Dataflow, you do the left, not the right. However, at the end of the day, most of these pipelines end up being a hybrid of both. You will probably do some common scenarios in visual data flow. And then you'll include that in your pipeline with some of your own custom stuff that you'll do in your own language, your own, you know, in Spark using the language that you like. So what I'm going to show, I have, uh, I'm going to stop at about two minutes and go into the demos. So I think I'm okay on time here. A, a couple more slides to show you some pictures if I don't get to it in the demo. When you build the data flows to execute on data, on data bricks, you will see the list of transformations on the left. So we, we surface this to you similar to other ETL tools in the way that we provide you an ability to transform data. You don't need to know anything about Spark to, to make any of this work. You don't even need to know about Databricks because we will um, handle the cluster management for you. The end result looks like the middle, but on the right-hand side, and I know it's hard to read, I'll, the demo will be better, on the right-hand side is the expression language. So there is a way to express things like regex to be able to do trims, left, right, add, um, standard deviation, uh, sound X is in there. All the different things that you can do commonly in transformations within Spark surface to you in an Excel-like language. I threw Excel into the discussion anyway, like that. In an Excel-like function language that you use within your transformations. And then, you, this is where you dive into your data. We sample the data for you as you're building your flows so that you're not left in the dark. You don't build an entire transformation um, logical flow and then cross your fingers and hope it works. We surface to you samples from, the, from your data. And then we give you stats about your data, your value, your value counts, your um, number of nulls, those sorts of things. Awesome. Last slide. So when you are done executing your data flow, we can then surface to you the execution graph of that. So we don't, you may want to have some control over how your transformations are executed. We provide you control around things like having a push down, having the ability to have broadcast joins. Being, or choosing when to and when not to. We also give you control over partitioning of your data. And then this execution graph will tell you that, OK, <clears throat> you were creating a column here. And by the way, we give you lineage on here. So when you're creating new columns or modifying columns, we'll show you the flow of how you got to the end. So think of this as a very graphical way to do the things that a data engineer does in Spark every day, right? Or an ETL tool. This is, if you've seen Informatica, SSIS, Talon, you're probably like, yeah, this looks awfully familiar. But this execution graph will tell you how long each step took, how much data was flowed in and out, how many columns were modified, <clears throat> and, all, and all that sort of thing, as, as well as the data lineage on that. Perfect. OK, I'm going to go over to a demo. So I'm going to do the magic trick of switching to my laptop. Let's see if I get this right. Hey, look at that. OK, perfect. So let me start with a, I'll give you a quick overview, overlay of <coughs> Data Factory. Actually, I showed you some of the slides. That should already be pretty familiar to you. I'm going to skip some of the other important resources over here. So when you work in Data Factory, you're going to work with these primary sets of resources. On the left, I do have Zoom on here, so let me check this out. So you'll work with pipelines. That's where you build your workflow. That's the control flow structures going there. Your data sets define the data you're connecting to, so the schema. We talked a little bit about this in some of the morning sessions I did here. This one I was walking in and out, talking about mapping different fields and having schema. You know, um, that was I think he was talking about going from RUDs to data frames. But very important when you work with data to have that schema and information about that schema. So you define those in data sets. 
data flows are what I just showed you with building the transformation logic, and templates. So all these things that you build within Data Factory, you can make into a template and you can collaborate on, you can share with, um, with your teammates to be able to uh, reuse the logic that you've built in your uh, pipelines. So very, very simple pipeline I have here. I'm just copying some data from whatever source. Maybe this is Oracle or on-prem, doesn't matter. I'm putting it in the lake. Once it's in the lake, and, and by the way, within Azure land, for us, the lake could be a blob store. It could be Azure Data Lake sto uh, store. It doesn't matter, but it's, it's a lake sort of you know, um, storage within Azure. And then you run your Azure Databricks notebook. So what we do is we connect into the notebook. So the notebook is defined by what's called a link service. A link service is your connection credentials to all the different things that you grab data from and you move data to. And then in the settings, what will happen is you'll be able to then have a connection to that Databricks cluster, and you can see all the different types of uh, notebooks and code that you have. So this is a notebook activity, so I'm only going to see the notebooks here. Okay, so I'm going I'm to pick that notebook, and then you can open it. So you can open, you can edit directly from here. So notice now in this scenario, I am orchestrating a pipeline that is, um, that is executing my notebook code, but I have to jump out into Databricks to do that. So this is an example, by the way, that um, is the soccer events example. Now, I'm not a um, soccer aficionado. I'm a baseball guy. So I don't know all that much about the data, but I will tell you that this is a good example I'm going to stick with for just, just a moment because, again, narrowly focusing as a PM as I have to within Data Factory, I focus very much on what you all do from data engineering, from data engineering perspective. So I thought this was a pretty good example of the things that you would do in Notebook to do a lot of these actions. So you'll see that in this Notebook, if you haven't seen this before, this one will do things is it's going to create um, some folders. It's going to get some data, some sample data, put the CSV into the folder. You're going to do things. You're going to just peek at that data by doing a, a, um, a top or a head on that. And then you're going to map it. So you're going to create a schema around it, and you're going to create some data frames and take a look at the data. So you're going to peek into the data once it's in a data frame. So common things that you do in Spark and Databricks all day long in notebooks. Then we start to do things like we start to um, create some mappings for that data from um, the essential enumerations, the codes, into text for each of those. So there's some data type conversions, there's some mapping, there's schema, three very common things, and there's transformation. And then, uh, here's, uh, sorry, here's the dictionary mappings I was talking about, retaking enumerations and recoding those. Very common to do in ETL as well. And then the last thing it does is some analytics. So these analytics, the analytical functions, like um, this is using um, Quantile. So bucketizing, those kinds of things, those kind of analytics are also built into um, Data Factory data flow. And very common things that you'll do when you're building, <laughs> when you're building data integration with Spark as well is to do things like min, max, standard deviation. For me, end tile and those sorts of operations, because um, data factory is based on ETL and, and SQL. That's a window function, essentially, to do that, right? So you have to create a, you partition your data, um, and you create a window of time in which to look at that, and you can do uh, end tile on it. Okay, what I want to do is I just want to step you through what things look like in a notebook. Now, if you were to then say, all right, what does that look like in data factory if I were to build it directly in data factory instead of having my notebook? Good question, Mark. So what that looks like when you do it in data factory is you build a data flow. So I have the data flow built here in a, a data flow. So this is where you make your choice. Do you want to, I shouldn't say it's a choice. I should say what happens a lot of times in the customers I work with, especially with the larger customers, is that they will have some data analysts who want to do, this is a very simple transformation, right? The things we talked about in that notebook are very rudimentary. But they're difficult to do if you don't know <coughs> Python or Spark. So if you have folks within your organization who need to do these things, you want to leverage the power of Azure Databricks then you can use Dataflow. This is very simple to be able to do these things and be able to just pull down a, a menu and say, I want to join. Um, I want to do an end tile, so I need a window for that. I want to aggregate data. That's all you do. You just work at that level. So you see at the bottom, this is my peek into the data. So this is just like the part of the notebook where I was peeking at the data. Um, the right-hand side is looking at value counts. So I'm seeing the distribution of data across that column. Um, and then what I do is that this is just the mapping. So you'll see that we have what we call projection. Same thing as you're doing in the Spark notebook code. You're taking your columns, you're giving them names, and you're giving them data types. We have an auto detect type, so you can have us kind of peek into the data, and we will estimate what those data types are going to be. 
And then you move on from there. And so notice I have two sources. I'm going to join those together later. These aren't really two sources. This is more of a reference lookup. This is, I'm showing you two different ways to do the really common um, mapping that was occurring in the notebook of essentially doing um, field mapping. I see the light on, thank you. Uh, field, not field mapping, but enumeration mapping, right? You're going from a code to a text. So I just have a simple file that has all those uh, numbers on the left and all the values on the right. If you don't like that method, just do a case statement, because again, we have an expression language, and do it this way. To me, that's kind of hard coding way of doing it. So I kind of like the external file way better. But I think you get the idea of how you do these things. And so let me see if I did a day preview on that. Yeah, so what that looks like at the end of the day when you join, oops, yeah, when you join those things together and you, um, let me do the join actually. So after you've brought in the reference data and you join them together, you're going to see then, uh, I believe I'm doing a, um, I'm doing a left, I'll show you the syntax for this. I'm doing a left outer because the left side is everything coming in, the right side is the reference lookup. So I went all my left with all the matches from the right. So I put my little icon of left outer, and then I do my data preview, and then I will see, I should have brought a mouse, I should have brought a mouse. And then you will see the data that is joined to each one. So um, Booleans are shown as Xs and checks. And by the way, I do get confused sometimes as to which one is yes and which one is no. I don't know if I like that, anyway. And then you get all the different things that came from that lookup. So the, the values for, I think it was, uh, which one was I doing here? Yeah, it would have been type is then there is the enumeration value, there is the text for that. That's very simple stuff. And then here is how you do the analytics. So uh, we were doing some binning of data. We were um, creating, um, uh, what was it, bucketizing by 10, I think it was. So that's an end tile by 10. So here is the expression language. So let me just take this out and show you what that looks like. So as you start to type, you get IntelliSense, you get help with all these. So I could say, oh, you know, I'm not really sure what the entire does. I need to find out about it. There's a very lengthy description of what entire does, which is still confusing when you're done reading it. Our pad's easier to understand, right? Write pads, the string, by the supplied padding until blah, blah, blah. So you just add those in. So entire, and I did 10. Let's see if that squeaky goes away. There you go. Boom, you're good to go and then you sync it. So I'm syncing to a database. So we have the connectors built into Data Factory. Data Factory has 80 some connectors to SAP, Oracle, HANA, SQL Server, blah, 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 all those different things. So you can land that wherever you want to. Um, customers right now using this tool within Data Factory, probably a half and half, keeping things in the lake versus moving them into a database. That's completely up to you. You have a bunch of connectors that you can do. You'll see under data sets, all the different kind of connectors available to you. There they are, boom. And I'm actually just about out of time. So let me go back to the slides real quick. And like I said, I'm going to step into the back then. So if you have any questions, just come see me. Um, don't forget to rate and review the session. And um, I think that's it. So I, I think we have, do we have, yeah, let me just do that. I'll just park all the questions to the back. Is that a good idea? Sound good? And uh, thanks for coming. Appreciate it. Oh, yeah. <laughs>